Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to a special show today. Normally, we come to you as a call-in show where you can call in and ask questions or talk about things going on in your yard, landscape, garden. Uh, today, we're going to be visiting with a couple of special guests, and it, it's a pre-taped show, so don't try to call in. We'll be back live again next week. Uh, but today, we're fortunate to have a couple of folks from the Department of Horticulture here at Texas A&M, and we're going to talk about wines, grapes and wines here in Texas. It's a holiday season. And you may be thinking about heading out to buy a special bottle of wine for uh, holiday events or gatherings with friends, even in between the holidays. And we have Andrea Borazatu and Justin Shiner from the Department of Horticulture. Andrea is an enologist. And Andrea, welcome, first of all. And what is an enologist? Thank you for having me. Yeah, an enologist is a wine scientist. So enology means wine science. And perhaps people wonder, what, what does that mean? Uh, there's a science to wine. And indeed, there is quite a bit of science, actually. Um, if you think about wine aroma and wine flavor, um, all that is derived from chemical compounds, aroma compounds. Um, also, wine has to be produced via fermentation process. So there's a bit of microbiology um, involved there as well. And wine has to be appreciated um, via our senses, um, our sense of uh, taste and smell and sight. So there's quite um, um, an important component of sensory science uh, in wine science also. Well, I'm sure we'll kind of touch around the edges of that as we talk today. But thanks. That's, that is cool. Uh, Justin, you're, you're a viticulturist, right? Yeah. So you could simply say I'm a grape guy. A grape guy. <laughs> yes. A grape. So I've been told. Great or grape, which is the... Either. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, Texas A&M has uh, a lot of work, uh, both research and also extension work uh, in the area of viticulture, grape growing, and enology. Uh, and I'd like to start off just by hearing from you guys a little bit about the grape industry here in Texas and the winemaking industry uh, here in Texas. I think a lot of people aren't aware of just how far Texas wines have come. Uh, Justin, why don't you start off, if you don't mind, just a, a real brief history over the years. I know back going back to Del Rio and, and some of the early work, but tell us a little bit about the grape sure. industry. Sure. So we have uh, one, one winery that made it through Prohibition. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they were established in 1883. That's Valverde Winery. Okay. And so we actually made a, quite a bit of wine before Prohibition. Texas has an incredibly long history with winemaking, but I'll, I'll save you a, a little bit of maybe bore or a long story. We'll fast forward after Prohibition, and the industry was pretty stagnant. That's the whole entire U.S., and mm -hmm. it wasn't really until about the 1970s that the industry in Texas really started to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, it still remained in a fairly infantile state, I would say in, until around the 90s to the 2000s, and that's where we've really just taken off mm -hmm. as far as a uh, number of wineries, Vineyards, we have vineyards now across the entire state, Brownsville to El Paso to Dalhart, Orange, everywhere in between. Wow. And of course, locally, we have vineyards, you know, Messina Hoff right in our back door here. And there's vineyards even uh, within an easy afternoon's drive uh, with from the Bryan College Station area if people want to get out and, and experience some different things. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, Peach Creek, which is South College Station. We've got mm -hmm. Messina Hoff and Bryan. We've got uh, others that are in uh, easy drive, you know, in a day or an afternoon. So if you're looking at vineyards, we don't know exactly where all the vineyards are because you don't have to register to have a vineyard. A lot of people have. <laughs> they don't have to drive acre. to the Horta Department and get permission to plant grapes in Texas? Uh, not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we hear from a lot of them and we love to hear from them. Yes. Uh, we're glad to help yeah. when, when we can, but we do know how many wineries we have because you okay. have to have a license, federal and a state. And I can tell you there are wineries in over 120 of our 254 counties, which is wow. pretty impressive. That that is surprising. I did not know that. That's that's a lot of wineries. A lot of wineries. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, wineries here in Texas and uh, some of the the um, new wineries. Have, I'm sure are coming on the the market all the time. But uh, 
we have wineries up in the high plains, uh, That's different right. regions. So just to put things in perspective, when I got here, um, Texas A&M, about four years ago, there were 220 wineries, uh, winery permits registered. Uh, today, there are over 620, and that's within wow. a four-year span. Um, and these are winery permits. And um, most of the wineries are located in two main regions in the Texas Hill Country and North Texas. Mm -hmm. um, but we have wineries really all over the state. Mm -hmm. However, the, the concentration is, is there. And um, we they range in size from small uh, boutique mom-pop wineries to big volume um, producers as well um, that make many, many, um, they, they process many Texas varietals okay. uh, and produce excellent excellent wines. And and excellent not just because they're from Texas and we like Texas, but they've actually won awards. Oh, they won awards and they continue to win awards at um, national and international competitions. Um, wow. We see golds, double golds, best in class. Um, that happens year after year after year. So this is a um, continuing sustainable um, situation we have here in Texas. Yeah. The quality is there um, and um, our wines can compete with um, any other wines in the United States and abroad uh, oh. without a problem. Well, that's cool. Well, that that's good to know. You know, it's a uh, it's it's always fun to try things out locally. You know, there's local food and uh, there's a lot of interest in those kinds of things. It's nice knowing that even though we're late to the party, maybe uh, compared to some wine regions of the world, we. Uh, We've arrived uh, and are doing well. Um, so you were talking about the, the Hill Country, which is a big wine region in terms of number of, of vineyards and wineries, and then the High Plains up, you know, Panhandle Lubbock direction and, That's and right. south of there. So the Hill Country is a, a big region for wineries. Uh, there are a lot of wineries. However, grape producers mm -hmm. um, um, tend to be located in um, the High Plains. And mm -hmm. Justin can... Yeah, tell us a little that. bit. Why is it that we see so much more production in a place like the High Plains as opposed to uh, Beaumont, Texas, for example? Well, there's really two primary reasons. One is just the experience of farming up there. A mm -hmm. lot of row crop production. It's a lot easier to you know, transition from uh, growing really anything to, uh, to a new crop versus having no agriculture background. Mm -hmm. we, we visit with people who have vineyards who have literally maybe not had a garden before. Mm. Which is uh, that's that's a, that's a there's a lot to learn there. That's a hurdle. Um, the other is just the the climate, the soil there. Okay. So it's fertile farmland. We we know that that's obvious. There's water uh, there. Grapes don't have a, a tremendous water requirement, but well, we we recommend that all vineyards in Texas have irrigation available. But as far as the climate goes, and that's what's going to influence the quality and then the disease, mm -hmm. which translates into cost to grow the grapes. And so if you look at the, the best wine regions around the world, the most famous, the highest quality wines, they tend to be uh, a little more Mediterranean-like in their climate. So if you consider the high plains, uh, there's a rise in elevation. You mm -hmm. go up on the Cap Rock, the Llano Estacado, we're looking at 3,000 to 4,000 feet. Yeah. And it's it's more arid, so it's drier. And it makes a difference in nighttime temperature, doesn't it, a little bit? Nighttime temperature is huge. So everybody knows Napa, maybe Sonoma. You've got mm -hmm. the Pacific Ocean, that, that influence. And at night... That cold water brings in cold air, yeah. and the nighttime temperatures drop. It might be 100 degrees during the day, but it drops down in the 50s at night. And we see something similar to that in the high plains where there's a larger diurnal temperature swing, so daytime versus nighttime. And so what that does is that uh, changes the ripening profile of the grapes. Okay. So, you know, if you think about ripening, it's metabolism. The warmer the temperature, the faster the metabolism. And so if you have high nighttime temperatures, ripening is really fast. And it just changes the ripening profile, whereas if it's cooler, uh, it changes the flavors, the acids, things like that. So, uh, Andrea, I was talking about uh, some of the organoleptic qualities of, of, uh, of wine and, and grapes. So the same grape grown in the High Plains, if you could get that variety to grow in southeast Texas, it would be a very different wine. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> we, we call that uh, the influence of, of, you know, the climate, the soil, and even the, the people there, uh, terroir. Okay, terroir. It's, it's, not yes. our, it's not a Texas term. It's not our term. Believe right. it or not, we borrowed it from the French. Yes. Looks like looks like the word terror to me or terrier. <laughs> or terrier. Or terrier yeah, the, do correct. the dog. Spell, spell, yeah. spell check will uh, we'll mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that is an interesting thing because, and the reason I was asking that is I think a lot of people – you know, they go somewhere, maybe they go to California or France or someplace, and they taste this grape, and they go, I, I want to grow this in my house. Well, 
number one, you probably can't. But if you could, you're going to get a little bit different uh, quality of grape out of it. I know with the American grapes like Concord and Niagara and whatnot, I, Concord down here seems to ripen one berry at a time as opposed to a cluster at a time. See, I would go out on a limb and I would say anyone in Texas can grow a grapevine and successfully <laughs> grow grape, you know, grow fruit, make wine or whatever out of it. But it's all about what variety you pick. Okay. Just because it's for sale locally doesn't necessarily mean it's going to grow. And I, I just have to sidetrack with one quick question and comment. I'm setting you up here. Uh, tell us about Texas and native grapes, because I think people would be surprised since you don't think of through the eons, Texas being a wine region. What about the number of grapes that grow here? So, so what we like to tell people is there's a little Texas in all wine anywhere wherever, anywhere around the world. If you get a wine, there's a little bit of Texas in there. It has to do with our wild grapes. So if you think about the location of Texas in the U.S., you've got humid southeast, mm -hmm. right? High rainfall in East Texas. And then you have desert southwest and west Texas. So we kind of span that climate. And we have grapes that are adapted to that the humid, more humid conditions as well as the arid conditions. And so what that means or results in is uh, 13 different native species of grapes in Texas, which is uh, far more than any other state. So we have a huge diversity. More native species of grapes here. Than, that is correct. Than, okay. And, and so the grape breeding programs that exist that uh, you know, deliver new grapes to us that still exist, they come to Texas to collect grapes. Okay. Because if they're interested in some specific trait or feature, maybe um, soil adaptability or some resistance to pests, mm -hmm. you can come to Texas and typically find those genetics or those traits and then use that for your breeding program. Well, give us a little quick history lesson into the story about uh, the grape phylloxera in France and Texas grapes yes. that I think because uh, everybody thinks of France is the place to it's like the motherland of wine or whatever and I, I'm sure a lot of people disagree with that so, but so every Texan should know this story um, and, and they don't even even the ones local to this town in Denison Texas uh, where that where the history takes us um, but you kind of have to go back in time uh, much further and talk about it briefly the domestication of grapes and so Hunter and gatherers collected grapes, modern day uh, Armenia, Georgia, mm -hmm. Black Sea, Caspian Sea. And when they did that, when they started to plant seeds, they would improve them because mm -hmm. you would collect seeds from a uh, grape that had bigger fruit and better fruit. And uh, after they did that for several thousand years, we had modern day varieties, Pinot Noir. Uh, the Romans described Pinot Noir a thousand years ago. Really? So grapes had been improved vastly by the time uh, uh, North America, the New World, was colonized by the Europeans. They bring those grapes with them naturally, and they fail to grow because they didn't have resistance to our pests and diseases, mm. which is which is not surprising. That happens in plants a lot. It happens a lot. You introduce something exotic, and mm -hmm. uh, you know it can it can cause some major problems. That happened with one of our native insects, Phylloxera. It's uh, similar to an aphid, uh, more or less in appearance, and it attacks the roots primarily of grapes. Our native grapes tolerate or resist the pests, so. You could call it, you know, a balanced ecosystem. The mm -hmm. insect survives and multiplies. The grapes survive. They reproduce. But it got introduced into Europe, mm -hmm. and it started to attack those European grapes, the Pinot Noirs, the Cabernets, the Chardonnays, and it would kill them. And over a period of about 30, 40 years, it killed several million acres of grapes, devastated the entire French economy. Uh, and the solution— And uh, roughly what— Part, what time was this? What? So this is, uh, so yeah, I should, I should say that. This is in the 1850s when it was actually introduced. England first, then into France. Okay. And so, you know, by the by the uh, latter part of the 19th century, um, you know, utter devastation. Okay. And so the insect was, you know, spread pretty rapidly. And at that time, grafting was, was commonplace. Mm -hmm. And it was thought that perhaps we could or they could graft those European grapes onto the roots of something that resists this pest. But alas, what grape uh, would work? Uh, so they so they sent uh, the French sent a delegation to uh, North America looking for a solution, and they attempted unsuccessfully to use one species native to the northeast, Vitis labresca. Mm. And in the meantime, there was a, a gentleman, a scientist, a horticulturist living in Denison, Texas, by the name of Tom, Thomas Volney Munson, T. V. Munson, and he developed a reputation as the expert of wild grapes. Okay. So the French sought him out. He was aware of the problem. He led them around Texas, and they collected six wagon loads of cuttings of our native grapes. There was one species in particular he pointed to, Vitus brillandieri, which is native to the Texas hill country. 
And not only did it resist phylloxera, but it was well adapted to alkaline, calcareous, limestone types of soils, which are common in some of the major wine regions in France. And that turned out to be the answer to phylloxera, and it still is to this day, no matter where you're at around the world, with a few exceptions, the grapes are going to be grafted on a native Texas rootstocks. So knowing that the water from the soil moves through the vine to make the grapes, Mm -hmm. every wine from France (laughs) has gone through Texas. Ooh, I like that. (laughs) (laughs) I... It was a cheap shot, but hey, it's kind of interesting. So. I'll go with it. <laughs> okay. And- Andrea, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the kinds of, of grapes and the wine you make from them. And as you do work in enology uh, here, tell us a little bit about uh, the kinds of things you're looking into to improve the Texas wine industry. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say, one time when we were visiting, uh, we were discussing the fact that when people think of wine, they think of... Uh, Cabernet, you know, or, or um, uh, uh, Pinot Noir, one of the, the familiar grapes to us. But there's some grapes that we're discovering have really great qualities and, and are awesome for winemaking that might not be familiar names to most people. That is correct. There are a lot of grapes um, that are not super well known that grow really well in Texas. They are well adapted to the conditions here, um, climatic and otherwise. Um, and these grapes have fantastic potential to produce really, really good wines. As I mentioned, they're, they're not as well known. So everybody's familiar with Cabernet Sauvignon, Riesling, Merlot, and uh, Pinot mm-hmm. Noir. Um, less so with Alianicos or Tempranillos. Maybe Tempranillo is an exception. But, um, you know, Montepulciano, Sangiovese, Sagrantino, these are all red wines. Oh. And then you have your Albarinos, Vermentinos, um Okay, now everybody is, cool. is frantically trying to write all that down. <laughs> and, and is fr- Franzi and Barefoot are not great varieties, by the way. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes, yes, Speaking but that's, that's good shots. to point out. There's a, there may be confusion between the actual name or brand name of a wine. Um, so you may give your wine a name, but that's not the same as the varietal that has produced the wine. So okay. um, that's something to note for consumers out there is, so they are not confused about that. The, there are the grape names and then there are the commercial names of wines, and and they should not be uh, mistaken for one another. So where are we in the process of moving from all the famous grapes that we tried to grow here Mm -hmm. to finding those Texas grapes and letting them make a name for themselves? So instead of someone thinking of Merlot or Malbec, they think of things like you were mentioning. I think there's been a lot of progress made. Um, Texas started with, uh, you know, f- noble wines and the better known varieties. But um, over time, um, they realized that there are other grapes that have better potential. And now there, we've seen a big shift towards these varietals. I think Tempranillo um, is one of the most um, successful ones here. Um, Alianico is doing pretty well. Um, one of my favorites, Dolcetto. Um, I think it's, it has a lot of potential as a lighter body red. Same mm-hmm. with white. So a lot of white, uh, grape growers and wineries are focusing now on these uh, newer varietals with much success from a quality standpoint. The problem is um, selling the wines and marketing mm-hmm. the wines because they are so yeah. um, unknown and people are unfamiliar with these varieties. Um, mm-hmm. They're... Um, um, Oh, gosh, what's the word? Um, embarrassed or... Um, yeah, it just do, it doesn't have a name brand. The, the name, yeah, the fact that they don't know the name, they don't know how to pronounce it, it kind of stresses them out. So yeah. um, uh, they don't have the comfort level to purchase those, those wines, which is a shame because they are really, really good wines. So people that are listening, and, and again, you named a bunch of them, mm-hmm. uh, where could they go to learn more about some of these good Texas grapes? Um, there are so many resources out there from um, our own uh, website and YouTube channels that um, we produce a lot of materials promoting these types of grapes. Okay. So, um, on the Texas AgriLife Enology and Viticulture channel or on our YouTube channel, like I mentioned, Twiga, the Texas Wine and Grape Grow Association, has a lot of resources about the grapes that grow well in Texas and okay. produce good wines. Um, the local Texas Hill Country Association um, 
Okay. So it, uh, is it winegrapes.tamu.edu? Yes. Uh, and could they go there and then from there click their way into the YouTube channel and other things? Yes. Basically. So wh why don't we just go with that one, the winegrapes.tamu.edu, and, and, and click your way through learning. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I, I, this gets me excited because I want to go out and try some of these. I, I can't even spell the, the names you were. You were that, that's right. Uh, and um, the wineries also, their websites, they are promoting these wines, and many of them um, – Put out information about the varieties okay. and description of the varieties and how to pair them, uh, wine and food. So if you're interested, absolutely, um, there's a lot of um, information and research that you can do and, and find your answers well, online. Great. And then there are the stores, the specialty stores, wine stores, specs. Um, they um, they don't have hundreds and hundreds of wines there, but yes. they have information to point you in the right direction. Okay. Well, you're listening to Garden Success, and we're normally a call-in show, but today we're coming to you by tape, and today's show is all about grapes and wine. If you're looking to purchase some wine for the holidays, for gatherings with friends, you do need to be listening. Uh, if you're jumping in late, you want to go back and listen to this uh, on the radio station's website where you can hear the whole show again and uh, catch up on what you might have missed. Uh, so let's talk about wine pairing and food. Uh, I guess a lot of people, their knowledge level is about like mine. Uh, let's see, fish gets a white wine and red meat gets a red wine. So take us a mm -hmm. little further than that. Yes, and that's a safe way to look at it. And uh, you, you're you not going to be wrong if you do that. <laughs> okay. However, I think we can have a lot more flexibility when we pair our uh, food with with wines. And we don't need to be super, super strict. We can be a little bit more creative. Um, I talk about... Pairing the wine with a uh, main protein. I'm mm -hmm. talking about meat, but the, the, there may be vegetarian uh, people out there listening. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do that. Try to pair the wine with a protein. Um, so white meat with white wine, red meat, or heavier meats with heavier wines. Um, however, I, I personally prefer to look at everything that surrounds the protein, especially if uh, the meats are cooked with a sauce uh, or some kind of uh, gravy. Um, I think we can very well pair. look at that to pair uh, our wines with. So a chicken, for example, with a red sauce, a tomato-based sauce, or a mm -hmm. red wine-based sauce, um, um, coco vin or chicken marsala, mm -hmm. that, that would match a, a darker um, a darker wine as well. I, 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 I don't recommend pairing a super tannic big red with a chicken of any kind, but a lighter mm -hmm. one, such a Pinot Noir or a Dolcetto, for sure would, would be possible to match with a, with a poultry dish that has a heavier sauce. Uh, on the opposite spectrum, if you have a uh, pork tenderloin, for example, with a creamy mushroom sauce, which is a cream-based sauce, um, you can certainly pair that with a creamy Chardonnay or a creamy Viognier or a surly Pinot Gris, uh, for example, which is a fuller-bodied wines, white wines, um, that can stand up to the both of the protein and the sauce. Nice. Well, I, I remember a time when having a screw cap on the top of wine meant you were drinking something very cheap. That, that is not the case anymore. Not the so case at all. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, again, there's been a lot of progress made, um, a lot of research put into screw caps, and they have come a long way. Um, Australia bottles or almost 99% of their wines under screw cap and those are very, very good wine. Same for New Zealand. There's a big shift in Europe as well for moving on to screw cap. Um, both types of closures, cork and screw caps, are valid closures. Mm -hmm. They tend to be applied to slightly different wines stylistically. So screw cap closures are more well suited for young wines. So if you want to age uh, your wine, then cork um, is better suited, not because necessarily it's better quality than screw cap, but mm -hmm. it just it has some certain properties that uh, would... Uh, favor mm -hmm. wine aging. Um, wines under screw cap are better consumed young. They tend to be fresher, um, fruitier, um, yeah, um, okay. just easier drinking. However, that, that there's no reflection on the quality of the wine um, based on, on the type of closure that they're using. Okay, so um, if you purchase a wine and you open it up and drink a little out of the bottle, uh, there are the little uh, devices that you pump the oxygen or the air out of the bottle to mm -hmm. kind of seal it. Uh, how important is that? And let's say I'm going to drink this wine over the next three or four days. Is it important to, to pump the air out? Or? It is. Um, so your wine is not going to spoil overnight. Um, it's not going to turn into vinegar overnight. 
but you do want to protect it. And one of the biggest enemies of wine when you want to keep it is oxygen okay. because it allows um, microbiological activity. So there are micro, you know, m- microbes all around mm-hmm. us in the air. Um, and there may be microorganisms in your wine um, as well. So they, they tend to become more active in the presence of oxygen, um, especially the aerobic ones. And, and that can lead to wine spoilage. That is the reason why it is important to try to protect your wine from that. So if you've opened up a bottle of wine, you've drank a third of it or half of it, um, you should try to remove the air. And you can do that with the vacuum pumps that you mentioned. Those mm-hmm. are little handheld devices that basically create a vacuum. They, they suck out the air from, from above the wine in your bottle. Mm-hmm. And then you can seal it and um, it keeps longer that way. You still should put it in the fridge. So don't leave your wine outside. Even a, even a red? Even a red. Mm-hmm. You want to keep it in the fridge. You want to consume it. If, when you're consuming it, you want to bring it out um, maybe an hour before you okay. drink it and let it warm up a bit. But for storage purposes, you should always keep your wines in for the fridge. For that microbial reasons. That for that microbial reasons. And so there are also, just one more thing I want to mention, yeah. the, the inert gas cans um, that you can find at, um, at HEB or at Specs. And these are little cans, um, canisters that contain either nitrogen or argon, and you can spray that on top of your wine in the bottle to replace the oxygen again or the air okay. uh, with an inert gas uh, that is not conducive to microbiological activity, and that would protect your wines as well. And they're fairly inexpensive and totally worth it if you have a good bottle of wine that you want to yeah, enjoy. sounds like mm-hmm. it. So there's one more solution yes. you should mention. Uh, to protect your wine from that is just to drink it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, well, I, I had a snide comment in the back of my mind. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to let that one go. So thanks for breaking it in. <laughs> anyway, well, so along the idea of air, on the other hand, when you open the wine, people talk about letting it breathe. And uh, my daughter has a new device she got. It's not new to the world, I'm sure, but new to us. You, She puts it on the wine. It's like a globe with a hole at the top. And so when you turn your bottle open to pour it forces a lot more surface area to the wine before it goes into the glass. We were just talking about not getting air, and now we're opening bottles and trying to give them some air. So tell us a little bit about that. So it's how you think about it. It's it's long-term versus short-term. So you do not want to expose your wine to air long-term if you want to preserve its quality. Short-term, if you're ready to drink, uh, and particularly with reds, but with some whites as well, um, it's a good idea to aerate them or decant them. It sounds like what your daughter has is an aeration device Mm -hmm. that uh, kind of uh, encourages the wine to come into contact with uh, quite a bit of oxygen um, that that does two things it volatilizes it helps volatilize some some of the aroma compounds in your wine it also oxygen will react with your tannins in your wine and that's why I mentioned reds because reds tend to have more tannins than whites um, and it softens them so the tannins will change their chemical structure in contact with oxygen and they will become rounder and softer so from a um Aroma and a taste standpoint, when you say soften a tannin, what do you mean? Well, if you think about a big red, um, say um, Syrah or um, a Mourvedre, um, there's a bit of, there's a lot of it, actually astringency, and that mm-hmm. the astringency is the the perception of rust, roughness on mm-hmm. your tongue and the sides of your cheeks, okay. and that is not to be confused with dryness or bitterness. Bitterness is a taste, and although they are usually they go together, um, mm-hmm. uh, they are different phenomena. So astringency is the drying out of your tongue and sides of your cheeks, and that's due to tannins which bind to salivary proteins okay. and drop out of solution. So hence the roughness. And so some wines can be very, very um, aggressive that way. The tannins can can cause a lot of astringency. Mm -hmm. Um, So exposing them to air will soften them. As I mentioned, they'll change the shape, their chemical structure, and they will become less astringent uh, in contact with air. Interesting. So I'm I prefer red wines over white, and I know there's great white wines. Mm-hmm. I just it's just my preference, but uh, there's an association of red wines, especially wines that have been uh, there have been a lot of sulfites added as a to preserve them a little longer with headaches. And could you kind of comment on that? Right, and thank you for this question. Um, um, there's a lot of misconception about that out there um, between amongst, amongst consumers. Um, there's no scientific proof that uh, sulfites will lead to headaches. And actually, sulfites in wines are, 
are at much lower levels than in other food products out there. Mm -hmm. And one classic example is um, dried fruits. Um, dried okay. fruits have a lot more sulfites added to them. Um, salad bars have a lot more more sulfites. And nobody's complaining about headaches after eating dried oh, apricots. Oh, like dried apricots mm -hmm. or something. Okay. Um, so really, there's there's no um, link between sulfites and headaches. Um, one cause, although Again, there's not a lot of scientific proof to that. Um, maybe tannins. Some people, a small percentage of the population, can be allergic to tannins. Mm -hmm. So um, that that can generate a um, a headache based on an allergic reaction. But that again, that a very small. That's a very small percentage percentage of the population. The biggest. Um, contributing factor that was found in the literature are biogenic amines and these are some chemical compounds that can be produced um, via microorganism metabolism again and those are like they are basically compounds like histamines they okay. do produce an allergic reaction they can lead to headaches I think the biggest culprit is alcohol really mm -hmm. um, usually Did red wines have tend to have higher alcohol level than white and um, they also have uh, higher tannins, but people will blame something else rather than... Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's good. So someone's listening to this show, and they're going to have a party in the next few days. They want to go to the store and get some nice wines so their guests can enjoy some different things. Is there any way you would guide them in how they go about shopping or some some types of wine or some grape varietals that they might want to look for? Uh I know that's a wide open question. It's kind of like giving someone a credit card and saying, mm -hmm. go to the mall and buy me clothes. You know, where do you start? But what are some just basic tips for someone wanting to kind of learn their way into some nicer wines? Right. Um, I think it depends on the budget. It depends on how many people you have over and the types of food. Um, I think that's a good um, time to ask this question because Thanksgiving is, uh, is coming up and the Thanksgiving dinner is... Um, so so much to offer. So with that in mind, um, I think it's it's a wise to start with wines that um, match a wide variety of uh, foods. I always like to recommend starting your um, gathering with a sparkling wine. Um, that that's always very festive, and um, it, sparkling wines go well with appetizers as yes. palate cleansers in between small bites, um, and they're bubbly. Who doesn't like a bubbly wine? Um, with that being said, I would recommend a dry sparkling wine, not a sweet one. So keep okay. your sweet wines for dessert if you if you're gonna have dessert. Um, then um, a, a, a mix of white and red. So have a white offering, a red offering, and there are wines that match well with a lot of foods. Um, Albarino comes to mind here in Texas as a good option. Um, there's an, another variety called Pique Poule Blanc that I really, really like um, here in Texas as well. For reds, I would suggest going with something lighter to medium bodied, mm -hmm. again, to cover a lot of possibilities. Yes. So um, that would be maybe a um, Dolcetto or a Sangiovese. Um, here in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going for heavier meats like pork or beef, then the bigger reds would be uh, a nice option. And then you have your cheeses that you can match oh, gosh. anything from white to red to sweet wines. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> so. <laughs> so many options. But if you're just beginning, try try some varieties that are really versatile and go with a lot of foods. And th okay. those would be your Albarinos. And That's good raisins. advice. Now, you mentioned sparkling. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's, cham there's champagne. What is champagne? And let's talk about sparkling wine and champagne and... Right. The floor is yours. Excellent question. Educate me. <laughs> so, so champagne is a sparkling wine. Uh, but like Justin said earlier, not all sparkling wines are champagne. So champagne, to in order for a sparkling wine to be called champagne, mm -hmm. it has to a, um, come from champagne, the champagne region in France, mm -hmm. in northern France. Now um, that, that's true of other things like Burgundy and, and other certain other names. Yes. It's a regional name. It is a regional name. That's correct. So the wines have to have been grown in the region of Champagne. Okay. There are three varieties that can be um, included in Champagne wines. So three varieties of grapes. You cannot make 
champagne with other varieties than these three, and those are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. And it's interesting to point out that two of these varieties are red grapes, um, and champagne traditionally is a white wine. Uh, yes. Uh, it's just the way you process the grapes that leads to the creation of uh, white wine without any skin contact. Mm -hmm. So um, it has to be these three grapes. It, they have to be from Champagne. Um, there are rules and regulations, local rules, in, in regards to how much volume you can um, produce from a given tonnage of grapes. So mm -hmm. from a certain amount, um, weight of grapes, you cannot, you cannot get more juice than what's legally um, allowable there in Champagne. Is that so, so you don't water it down? Um, it's just the quality of the juice. It okay. has to be at a certain level. So there's a lot of loss with that mm -hmm. um, because they can only press so much. The rest um, gets shipped to other wineries that it got, or it gets processed into different wines. Um, it has to be produced via the method champenoise, which is, so champagne is made, it's a two-step process, or maybe a three-step process, really. You make your base wine, which is a regular table wine, mm -hmm. and then to that you add your a little bit of extra sugar and a little bit of extra yeast mm -hmm. to re-ferment it. And that's how the bubbles are formed. They okay. are formed during the secondary fermentation well, where yeast will uh, metabolize the sugar into more alcohol and carbon dioxide. Okay. And the carbon di dioxide gets trapped into your bottle or fermentation container hence the bubbles. Mm -hmm. So champagne, to be called champagne, has to go through this specific process. Um, no other process is okay. allowable for champagne. So Every other sparkling wine um, can be made in different regions um, across the world, and there are different m methods of fermentation as well that, that don't necessarily follow precisely these steps, and there are no rules in regards to yield and juice pressing okay. and, uh, methodology. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So we don't have a Texas champagne officially. We have Texas sparkling wine. We do have some Texas sparkling wines. Yeah. We, okay. we cannot uh, legally have <laughs> Texas champagne, but yeah. Well, I don't think the French police are going to drive across and come get us and say you can't do that, right? Well, so if anybody's <laughs> in the wine that's listening, they're they're thinking, wait, I see California champagne on the there shelf. There you go. <laughs> that's a labeling issue as far as terminology goes. And if you had a label that said champagne that was approved by the federal government. They have to approve all wine labels. Before the year 2006, you're grandfathered in and you can continue to use it. But in the year 2006, the U.S. said, we're no longer going to use the term champagne or port. And like you were mentioning earlier, yeah. what they deem as semi-generic names. Oh, so por can, port is another one? You that's can't, correct. Oh, you I can didn't know You still find that. ports. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, as long as their label was approved before t the year 2006. Wow. But now what we say is technically port is, you know, made. Sweet, sweet red wine. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, made in the, in the correct region with its sanctioned grapes, just like Andre was talking about. Okay. The EU is full of rules and regulations that pertain to how you grow the grapes and how yeah. you make the wine. Well, Andrea uh, alluded to briefly the, the fact that champagnes aren't, aren't red and the grapes are red. Mm -hmm. uh, this past week I had a bottle of red Zinfandel, and I know a lot of people know Zinfandel as a white or pinkish kind of wine. And tell us about that thing with the skins that she alluded to and go into a little more detail on that. Yeah, so I've had the unfortunate uh, circumstance of, uh, you know, I'm in a restaurant, a nice steakhouse. Zinfandel is a red wine grape, mm -hmm. so the grapes are, are black and the color comes from the skins. And how you get that into the wine is you leave the whole berries during the fermentation. Mm -hmm. So you take the grapes, you smash them up, you add some yeast. Fermentation starts, you mm -hmm. leave the skins in there until it's done and the color bleeds or is extracted out. If you wanted to make pink or white Zinfandel, mm -hmm. you just press the juice out of the grapes. A little bit of color comes mm -hmm. out and you end up with a pink wine. Okay. So if you order Zinfandel on the wine menu, make sure that it's a red or a pink, depending on what mm -hmm. your preference is. And uh, white Zinfandel, it's a very, it's very popular still, but it mm -hmm. happened by accident. Oh, really? So, uh, you know, grapes were harvested. This is in the West Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. Heavily crops. So Zinfandel will produce huge crops. So you can produce 20 tons of grapes on an acre with certain varieties. 40,000 okay. pounds of grapes. And there's a point where... Just, just for a, a, a reference, Justin, mm -hmm. what would some of the other on the other end grapes produce per acre? Instead of 40,000 pounds... So it's that's manipulated by the grower, uh -huh. uh, but uh, you know, on average, say here in Texas, our average yields are going to be three to five tons okay. per acre. Okay, so that's a big difference in the number of wine bottles you get out of that. Absolutely. Acre. Okay, go ahead. And so there is a point, and you can vis you know you can visualize this. If you've got a peach tree in your front yard, it's you know four foot tall. 
you have one that's uh, 12 feet tall next to it, you would expect the 12 foot tall peach tree to be able to ripen a lot more peaches. Mm -hmm. So similar thing with grapes where depending on how you prune them and manage them, it could carry too much fruit than the vine could actually ripen, 20 tons per acre. And so what you end up with is a loss in ripening characteristics. Flavor is diluted, sugar is diluted, and then color. And so Zinfandel, this Zinfandel, the first uh, white Zinfandel was what we would call overcropped. So a huge crop, it didn't fully ripen. In the winery, they're fermenting it. You add yeast, the yeast just eat the sugar, just like you and I. Mm-hmm. And they just happen to excrete a waste product, ethanol, mm-hmm. which is what you know makes wine, wine and carbon dioxide. And so the yeast, uh, they stalled out, they stopped fermenting. This can happen for various reasons, but the wine was pink. It still had some sugar, some sweetness mm-hmm. left in it, and it was relatively low alcohol. And they said, well, we need to try to get this fermentation started again. And you can add more yeast, and there's some other things you can mm-hmm. do. But they tasted the wine, and they said, well, this wine actually is kind of pleasant. It's fruity. Mm-hmm. It's got some sweetness, and it's pink. Maybe we right. should just bottle it as is. And it turns out that was hugely popular, and other wineries started to duplicate it, and then White Zinfandel was born. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have people in my family who will go unnamed that the <laughs> sweeter, fruitier a wine is, the more they like it. And, you know, wine snobs are usually heading the other way, on the other end of the spectrum. So this leads us to one of those misconceptions <laughs> again, and there's a, a, a million in, in the wine world. Uh, the What, the sweeter the wine, the sweeter the grapes, or something along okay. those lines. there you go. That's totally up to the winemaker. Hmm. So when you add yeast uh, to grapes to, to start the fermentation, they will consume or eat all of the sugar until it's gone, or until mm-hmm. they produce so much alcohol they can't survive. Mm-hmm. And so in order to have a sweet wine... Typically, what a winemaker will do is they will let the yeast do their thing and finish fermenting it, and then they will add sugar back, table sugar, cane sugar, to whatever the desired sweetness level is. So they're more, much more careful than just letting the yeast stop wherever they're right. happy. They right. will add it uh, until the wine is balanced or it's pleasing or it fits, you know, whatever target audience there is. Maybe it's yeah. the super sweet, pe- you know, wine people. Well, I'm not a wine snob, but there are some wines that I don't care for, and, and the sweetie, sweeter and fruitier they are, the the less I tend to care for them. I think I told you before I joked with a family member that uh, that, to me, if I were uh, a sommelier, I would say, well, that's uh, cotton candy with a hint of bubble gum. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> well, so I, I think of it as coffee. Uh, that's a really good comparison. You were talking about how do you find a wine, you know, that you like in the supermarket. So first thing is to figure out what styles you like. Absolutely. So if you're a coffee drinker, some people prefer black some people mm-hmm. prefer cream and sugar you got dark roasts there's all this variation so uh if you can pinpoint what type of wine you like do you prefer sweet do you prefer dry which is the term dry means no perceivable sweetness mm-hmm. uh that'll help you figure it out and you can go from there so all those red wines you see in the grocery store they're going to be dry for the most part unless they say otherwise on the label so okay. if it's Merlot and Cabernet and Pinot Noir mm-hmm. and it's it's red, it's go- not going to be sweet mm-hmm. uh, as a rule of thumb. If it is, it will say mm-hmm. sweet red or semi-sweet or something along those lines. Yeah, and there's you mentioned white Zen. There's a white Merlot and then uh, some a lot of other. Uh, Muscat is a very sweet wine. Well, and there's a lot of pink wines now. Pink Moscato, excuse popular. me. I, well, I, I named a grape. and Muscat, Moscato, those are kind of interchangeable. There's, okay. there's a, a handful of grapes in this family. We call them Muscat family, and they okay. produce these aromas that smell like Fruit Loops and candy and cotton candy and things okay. like that. Um, they're pretty popular right now. Fruit. And almost all of those are sweet. I've never seen the word Fruit Loops in the description on the back of a wine bottle, though. That's a <laughs> that, yeah, that's probably trademarked. <laughs> that's a new one. <laughs> okay, well let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Texas and grape grape growing in wine regions. Uh, either you or Andrea mentioned the Hill Country and the High Plains, but there's some other official regions now in Texas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, the history of winemaking in Europe is thousands of years. France is slightly smaller than the state of Texas. Which we like to point out. We, uh, you know, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> I might mention it again before this is over. Um, and so because they have this long history in France, they know that uh, Reims, the Champagne region, is very cool. They yes. cannot fully ripen the grapes. Yes. They can't grow Cabernet. It just won't ripen. And so they're better off making Champagne, which is made from grapes that are less ripe and have more mm-hmm. acid, which is why Champagne's tart. So they've basically designated that region as... Champagne, that's what we want to that's what we want to grow and make there. Mm-hmm. Bordeaux, for example, 
most people know Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. It's actually a region that is conducive to make red wines, Cabernets and Merlots. So those grapes are sanctioned to grow in Bordeaux, certain styles. Like I said, there's a lot of rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. There's some value to that because if you know, you go to the store and you see Bordeaux on the label, you have an idea of what's what's going to be in the bottle. You have some some indication. So there's some value there. And so in the U.S., we wanted to uh, not copy that system, maybe even improve it. Uh, but we wanted to be able to have a system like that. It's called an Appalachian system. Appalachian. Appalachian. Not not as in the mountains, but A-P-P-E-L? That's right. Okay. That's right. And you can Google it, and uh, you can read to your heart's content about Appalachians. Okay. And so if you wanted to have an Appalachian, we're going to call it um, Aggie Land, <laughs> you have to uh, petition the federal government. Somebody has to provide oversight. Okay. And so the uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau, the TTB, rolls right off the tongue, they regulate alcohol in the U.S. Okay. And so they would regulate what the recognized appellations are. And so you would have to petition them and say, we want to call this Aggie Land um, Appalachian, which is actually American Viticultural Area. Mm-hmm. That's, and, that's, and, be, and be able to make a case for your... Yeah. Why it's distinct. You mentioned like the high cool area of France, mm-hmm. but it's also the the soil, the the terroir that you talked about before. That's part of that Appalachian. Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, it's all that's all goes into it. And so, if you wanted to have your Appalachian here, you would have to one show that uh, Aggie Land's a name that's been in use mm-hmm. for a while, if that was your name. Two, you would have to show the boundaries of it, uh, exact boundaries, and then you would have to explain why they exist. The soil is distinct right here. The mm-hmm. climate is distinct because of the topography. Some rationale behind mm-hmm. it, and um, and you may or may not be granted uh, uh, an American viticultural area status. So okay. we have eight in Texas. Eight. Eight. And uh, some of them are actually what are some of, at least very some of them. large. So mm-hmm. we have one in North Texas called Texoma, mm-hmm. and it's three counties. Uh, along the Red River up there that have some distinct features. We have the High Plains American Viticultural Area, which is out you know, towards Lubbock. Uh, Terry County probably has the largest concentration of vineyards in the state. Uh, we have the Hill Country AVA, which is uh, a large area of the Hill Country. Within the Hill Country AVA, we have Bell Mountain, and then we have some others that are more distinct. So we can have... Okay. A large AVA, and within it, we can have much smaller ones. Okay, and then there's a really small one kind of out west central or uh, toward yeah. toward Del Rio from from the high plains that that's right of the eight um, <laughs> somewhere at tor- if, if I try to name them all um, I'm yeah I won't put you like in full but mm-hmm. uh, we have Messia Valley as well which is mm-hmm. a very which is very small at least the representation yeah t- um, in Texas okay so and, and just the real distinct um, we have Growing Davis Mountains, conditions. which da- might be the one. Right. Davis Mountains might okay. be the one that you're you're referring to as well. Okay. So we actually have mountains in Texas. If you haven't been out, <laughs> now, <laughs> the state. now we're doing the radio show here in College Station, so we're we're headed toward the opposite end of the state, of the southeastern region. Mm-hmm. And as you get southeastern, we grow some different wines or wine grapes here, and uh, Blanc de Bois being a, a large one. Will you talk a little bit about the kind of grapes you would typically find, let's say, from Bryan College Station? You know, down to Galveston, Beaumont, and sure. just yeah, I, that I, whole I, region. I could probably fill you full of useless wine factoids, and I'll try not to too much. I'm but, fascinated by them. <laughs> uh, you know, having this extensive history of developing grapes and growing them all over Europe, we have yeah. somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 named grape varieties oh grown gosh. around the world. And so uh, if you can't visualize that, you go into the grocery store, you see the apples, you've got Red Delicious, and you've got Granny yeah. Smith and all those. Those are varieties, different yeah. apples. They're all apples. They're different. And so here in Texas, we grow at least 70 commercially. Wine grapes. Yes. Wow. We can. We could grow uh, virtually any grape here because mm-hmm. we, our climate is so diverse. Our mm-hmm. soil is so diverse. Um, so we grow some that are widely recognized because if you want to sell your wine on a large scale, you need market recognition, name recognition like you talked about. We've got some more obscure, lesser known grapes that have really high quality. And guess what? They're really adapted mm-hmm. to the climate of Texas. And then we have some that are grown by necessity because if you want to plant a vineyard in College Station, Texas, there's this disease called Pierce's disease. Which covers most of the, oh, well, much of the state, not yeah. most of it. But. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, there's no, like, uh, definitive line, but I'd say mm-hmm. the eastern half of the state. Is I-35 it? east kind of-ish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a bacterial disease. It's from the U.S. Gulf Coast. It's endemic, and it's spread by really common insects. Okay. 
So it's widespread. And, and for the for folks that are listening, it's actually shared by some other plant species too. If you've ever uh, grown oleanders, you may have had oleander leaf scorch, and it's the same disease that affects the wine grapes, the xylella, the, yes. the Pierce's disease. So xylella fastidiosa is the you know the, the name of the bacterium, and it, yeah, it affects a lot of different plants. But there's different strains, which yes. everybody now knows strains, considering that right. the times everybody's familiar with those terms. Uh, but there's a there's a strain, Xylella fastidiosa fastidiosa, which is the one that influences grapes. The, the grapes. Wild grapes, it doesn't affect. Uh, it can live within them and not cause any problems. Those European grapes that we all know and love, they just don't have any natural resistance, and mm-hmm. it's lethal under in most cases to them. So... T- to decide you're going to put in a giant Cabernet vineyard um, in Houston, Texas, is probably not a good investment of your money. Um, I, I would advise against it. I would say, yeah. give me your money. I'll <laughs> kick you in the shins twice, and we'll call it even. You know, no. <laughs> you know one time, and this is totally off so- topic, but one time uh, I saw up in, in Arkansas, there was a pecan publication on starting a pecan orchard. And it said, if you're thinking about growing a pecan orchard in Arkansas, you should instead go to Las Vegas and stay there until all the money's gone, because at least that way at the end, you'd have the memory of a good time. <laughs> I, I've never seen good. that kind of candid <laughs> in an extension public. That is good. Well, <laughs> in, in all fairness, um, people, people, uh, plenty of people have tried it, and people are depending on your definition of success. You know, the grapes will grow. You go buy the Thompson seed that you find locally; it grows. The Concord, mm-hmm. it looks great, and it might last for years. But if it does get the bacteria, yeah. the Pierce's disease, you're going to have death, and it yeah. can wipe out whole vineyards. So what are our mainstays, or mainstay especially, the main one? Yes, I never got to your actual question. That's okay. We're... <laughs> so our mainstays are Blanc de Bois, which was mentioned earlier. This grape was developed in Florida, the University of Florida. It was released to the public in 1987, mm-hmm. and it made its way to Texas, and it just so happens it grows a lot better for us than it does for them. Okay. It's not grown very much in Florida, and we have it's our number one white wine grape by acreage. Okay. So we're the largest grower in the U.S., which means we're the largest grower of Blanc de Bois in the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have one called uh, Black Spanish or Lenoir. Lenoir. Is the synonym. Or Jacques. Mm-hmm. So when you have these grapes, you know, with a long history, they go by often many names. Yeah. This one, uh, we don't know where it's from. It's a very small, dark, dark grape, right? Very small. Uh, beautiful vine, productive. Um, it tolerates the disease, Pierce's disease. Mm-hmm. So it's our number one red wine grape. It makes a, a, a fabulous port style wine, so fortified wine, higher alcohol, really uh, where, concentrated flavor. Where you ferment it and then you you jack up the sugar a little further. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's it's great for that. Uh, there are some people who make really nice red table wines out of it, and mm-hmm. by that I mean just your standard wine that's not dry. Mm-hmm. But uh, it has a different flavor profile. Okay. So because it's part wild, it's got some different flavors. Um, some people don't necessarily like them. Or from a winemaking standpoint, it, it can be hard to uh, tame black Spanish. Okay. So if if someone was wanting to, to grow a wine grape in this area, those are the two main ones. Well, are there some things well, that we're looking into to expand that out? Yes. So we've, we've been uh, um, trialing different grapes since the 19th century. And I'm talking mm-hmm. Texas A&M. We've had... Many variety trials over the years, literally thousands of grapes, mm-hmm. trying to find ones that uh, grow best here. And at the same time, we have great breeding programs around the U.S. So okay. they breed for different issues. So if you're in a, you're at Cornell and you're a breeder, you're probably going to breed for grapes that have cold, to- cold tolerance. If you're uh, in Minnesota, it's absolutely critical. So there's a breeding yes. program. They've bred this uh, group of grapes that can withstand minus 35 Fahrenheit. They call them the polar bear gang. Uh, So they can grow grapes in Minnesota, and they do. On the West Coast at the University of uh, California, Davis, there's a breeder. And in the 90s, we uh, introduced, they imported, wasn't our fault, I don't think, (laughs) um, this insect called the glassy wing sharpshooter leafhopper, which Uh is a major vector or spreader of Pierce's disease. Yeah. Long story short, it, it's, it became a serious threat in California, so mm-hmm. they started to breed new grapes with resistance. And uh, as of this year, they've released five new grapes that are very much European-like mm-hmm. uh, in terms of flavor profile, even genetics, through, through conventional, traditional breeding. 
and we have those available now. Okay. And so there's other options uh, in addition to Blanc de Bois and Black Spanish. Okay, cool. Well, I'll look forward to seeing the new things that come along. Uh, you you mentioned European, so I just just for a moment, uh, let, tell us in a nutshell. We've got the American grapes that are things like Niagara and Concord. The um, uh, if it's wine, Mogan David, uh, that wine that people may be familiar with. And then we've got the uh, European grapes, French American hybrids. Tell us, what is the what is the story there on the grapes? So, uh, you know, the Europeans are the ones that have that history of, of development. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, American settlers, they weren't going to give up just because they couldn't grow European grapes. Yes. And so they would take the wild grapes and use those. And mm -hmm. some of the listeners have had wild Mustang wine. It can be hit mm -hmm. or miss, usually miss, unless they know what yeah. they're doing. Uh, but they also crossed intentionally these European grapes with the wild grapes and accidentally because grapes are wind pollinated primarily. Mm -hmm. And so Concord, everybody knows Concord, they're Welch's mm -hmm. grape juice. Mm -hmm. That was developed uh, by a guy named Ephraim Wales Bull in the 1850s in okay. Concord, Massachusetts. Okay. He crossed a wild grape in the Northeast Vitus Labrusca with, with some European grapes, planted lots of seeds. I did not know Concord was a, had European parentage. That yes. Okay. Otherwise, if it were the wild species, it's pretty pretty terrible. Rough. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it gets those flavors, that fruity Concord flavor uh, from that wild parent. That grape flavor <laughs> that everybody thinks of well, when you well, so Kool Aid. I, I lived in New York for several years, and uh, you know it's not something they advertise, but their number one mm -hmm. wine grape, as far as production goes, they're the third leading wine producing state. It's Concord. Really, they're a huge juice producer. Uh, Welch's juice. Welch's headquartered mm -hmm. in Western New York, yeah. Pennsylvania, Michigan. Yeah, so you have a whole group that are related. They all have okay. these what we call foxy flavors, these grapey types of flavors. Now, during the phylloxera epidemic, that insect that devastated Europe, mm -hmm. well, they started to also cross European grapes with mm -hmm. wild grapes. And then they developed this this group we call the French-American hybrids, mm -hmm. where they would cross French European grapes and American grapes. Okay. And then we have what we just call American hybrids, which would be like Blanc de Bois, okay. who's intentionally crossed with our wild grapes to get Pierce's disease tolerance. So there's all sorts of grapes out there. Okay. Uh, and there's many to choose from. And, the, and one of the last things I'll, I'll say here is if you want to taste a Texas, mm -hmm. you really have to seek it out. You can find some Texas wines at the grocery store, and I, and I recommend mm -hmm. you try them. But we have, uh, you know, five, six hundred wineries. All of them produce 10-plus wines, so there are literally thousands of wines to choose from. Look online or, uh, you know, go visit the wineries. Okay. that And that that is a fun thing to do, too, to get out and visit. I know they'd love to have you come. Uh, so... Just kind of closing down in a nutshell, winegrapes.tamu.edu to kind of pick your way through and learn some of the things that Andrea was talking about and and find out some of, about our program here at Texas A&M AgriLife uh, on grape growing and on enology as well. Justin, it's been great to have you. Those of you who have noticed Andrea being absent had to step out a little earlier on us, but it's great to have her as well. Uh, we'll be back live again next week, and we look forward to taking your gardening questions. But thank you, Justin, for joining us. Thank you. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.